All right, we're recording. So about VR business brokers, VR has sold more businesses in the world than anyone. It was founded in 79. So we've got four decades under our belt, been in the triangle for, for most of that time. Uh, I'm the second owner of this franchise in this market. And um, so we serve the triangle market and beyond. And But my story, as you heard from previously, we care because we've been there. I have been that owner who was considering his options for exit. And I bring that into every conversation that I have. I do have a private office in North Raleigh where we can have these confidential conversations and and I go to, to client offices. But that's that's a little bit about VR business brokers. Let's talk about our guest today. I'm gonna give Nigel a, an introduction here and then I'll bring him on and, and you can you can hear it from the man himself. Nigel Elkin is the CEO of Action Coach of the Triangle. And he, he walks the walk. He has a lot of experience in business. As you can see, uh, not only is he a certified business coach, but he has had several, several businesses. I think you're gonna hear that today. He's raised money for businesses. He's helped businesses. He's guided them through exits. In fact, he's, he's successfully guided through over $200 million of exits of businesses. So he's been there, done that. He, I, like, I like to partner with advisors like Nigel because not all, not, not all advisors that are in the coaching business or guiding owners are, are helping towards something. Some of them are just, just kind of, well, what do you need this week? But uh, Nigel's always got this long-term focus with setting owners up for success long-term. He is a founder at XPX of the Triangle, which is the Exit Planning Exchange. And it, this is a great association. It's relatively new. I'm proud to be a part of it as well. Check that out if you're an advisor and you serve owners in, in their exit planning. And on a personal level, he's the proud father of four kids. So he's in the fatherhood club, just like I am. It's, it's one of the best clubs to be in. And with that, let me move some stuff around here. I'm going to bring down this, this screen. So I'm going to go full screen. And then I'm going to invite Nigel. And boom, Nigel, you, sh you should have uh, capacity. There you are. Welcome, Nigel. Good yeah. to see you, my friend. Welcome to the Small Business Sales Series. I'm excited about our, our time today. Did I botch your interview? Would you like to add anything to, to what I put the, up there on the screen? No, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Neil. Cool, cool. Well, I'm excited to have you as our, our guest today. You know, we talk to, to owners. We, we, we talk about things that owners go through when they're going through these transitions in this program. And um, you and I had kind of some, some pre-talk about where to, where to go with this conversation. And it just kind of makes sense to start with this question of, you know, owners need a team of advisors when they're considering their options. Why would they even need a, a coach? Can you talk about why, why have a business coach in the first place? Let's start there. Well, one of the things you, you said earlier, which is uh, I walk the walk and talk the talk. And, and part of that is that, you know, I have, I founded my own businesses. I, my first business, I was um, was funded out of mortgaging my company in my home, and and I had to live off live off that as I was building that business for eighteen months before we started to kick in revenue. I I really wish that I had had a coach at that period of time yeah. that would have given me the smarter advice as to how I could have built that business even right from the beginning. Yeah. Um, but, but one of the things that uh, I think is true for nearly every business that that I talk to, every business owner that I talk to. They're not they're not exactly where they want to be, right? Mm -hmm. They are oftentimes they have some stresses, time stresses that they're working 40, 50, 60 hours a week. They they haven't really built the team that they want to have to get them into that next level of trajectory. And, and of course, there's, there's a money stress. Yeah. So, so, so that's the purpose of a coach is to, to it's, not, it's not a consultant, right? I'm not there to, to tell people what to do or even to do the work for them. I'm there to work with the business owners to help them progress 
their business the way they want to progress it. Yeah. So, so every owner kind of has this, this um, time and, and, and money and they have a team and at some point it's going to run thin. And, and I hear myself saying this to owners a lot, you know, the, the process of running your operating skills, what you're really good at doing and executing on to, to grow revenues or to run your business may be different than actually scaling the business itself and the management. And, and is that kind of where you're going with this? Well, absolutely true. I mean, like nearly every business owner has has some expertise, which is what enabled them to build the business in the first place. Oftentimes, they they have tested some of their ideas and actually have built up some custom base even before they even before they really started the business. Mm -hmm. And then what tends to happen is that they that almost every business owner that I work with has demonstrated the talent as a salesperson, largely because they're so passionate, because they really believe in their business and, and they have the gravitas when they talk, to, they talk to potential customers. That works fine, but then they get involved with the sales, they're running the operations, they're running the bookkeeping, they're, they're, they're doing all of the things inside the business. And, and that ends up and not being scalable. Right, because yeah. they can't be, they can't carry on building the cells. They can't carry on, carry on doing the operations. They can't be tweaking the machinery, because and then suddenly instead of working, you know, they they need someone to be working on cells for for 20, 30, 40 hours a week, and and they don't have that capacity anymore. Yeah, and, and I I call these quality problems to have that your business is getting bigger than than you can handle. And I think that's something that we all, we as, as founders, we start with nothing. We, we build one from none, but there's got to be this next level. Okay, we have, we have a viable business where we need salespeople at this point. Um, and it takes a keen owner to, to recognize when they need help on building their business and to, to value a coach, I think. That, that's true. And, and one of the problems that many of the business owners that I've worked with have is that when they bring in a salesperson, they look for certain qualities, certain experiences, but, but oftentimes they don't actually know how to manage the process or they haven't put together a marketing program which is effective enough to, to enable those salespeople to be successful. Mm -hmm. So they end up being disappointed with, the, with their hires. And so part of, the, part of the goal is to actually understand the bigger picture of what, what we're trying to accomplish, how we're going to ensure that the salesperson is going to be effective, how we're going to ensure that the marketing programs are going to be successful, how when we bring in the, the in additional operation people, how those people are actually going to fit together so we're building the right kind of team for the organization that the, the business owner is trying to build. I've heard a lot of wise people talk about this, how maybe the owner's too close to it. They're, they're not high enough off of or their organization because they're in the trenches that they need a broader view. Um, so the, the, what I'm hearing you say is the owner must transition from working in the business to working on the business, which Michael Gerber said that. That's a, that's a common insight. But what about, I mean, these owners, they've got their attorneys, they've got their, their accountants, their bankers. Why can't these people who are on the seller team, why can't they play this role that you're talking about of, of, show, of showing the bigger picture? Well, I, I, I call myself the unreasonable friend. Right? <laughs> and so, so the, you know, and I'm the only person in that group that is exclusively focused on helping them build their business, right? The accountant, the, accountant, the attorney, the, they all have different agenda. The banker is not actually trying to help you build your business. They're trying to secure their loans, right? They want to make sure that the money that that they'll that they're protected, but they're not trying to work with you in terms of understanding how to grow the business mm -hmm. and the, and the smart decisions in terms of how you're going to build the business. All of those people are obviously valuable and and important components. Friends and family, they're very good at, at supporting and and sometimes feel that they almost have a moral obligation just to be positive to every idea which, which you bring up. What I work with, with 
the business. So actually doing a, a, a much more thorough evaluation of the steps that they're going to be making so that they're actually thinking it through. And as importantly, they actually are moving towards the vision that they have for the business. Because if they don't have a plan as to where they're actually going to be taking the business, they're not going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. So this holistic view and, and uh, understanding that each of your other advisors on the team may be secularly focused on their, their part, but the, the business coach, and I would, I would argue the business intermediary, have this longer term path, this exit focused path in mind, if that's what, what the, the owner is, is focused on. So that's, there's huge value there in bringing in a coach. And again, I think a lot of owners are short-sighted and saying they can do it themselves and they don't see the value in bringing in a third party. I think that's really where you, you add a huge about, amount of value. Well, speaking of value, um, let's talk about why would you even wanna maximize value and one thing that I hear a lot when I'm talking to owners that maybe they've done it for 10, 20 years, they're making a good living and they've, they've kind of been through this growth phase and maybe they've plateaued somewhere and they're just comfortable in this, you know, they make a couple hundred grand a year or something and, and they're, they know they could make more, but they kind of took their foot off the pedal because they're comfortable. So let's just talk about this idea of why would you take it to the next level? Why would you maximize value? Why would you consider going down this path? It's, it's, a, it's a funny story, really, because, you know, the craziest thing for me to do is to, is to help a business to increase its valuation so that they get sold and then they're no longer my client, right? So, yeah. so that would, but why would I do that? Well, in actual fact, what I'm not overtly trying to do is increase the valuation of the business. It's a byproduct. So yeah. what, I'm, what I'm working with the owner is to enable them to be successful, to enable the business to scale more effectively, to identify markets where they can be the market leader and, and achieve the profits, where they, can, where they have so much new business coming in that they can, afford, they can afford to drop the low margin business and move to the higher margin business. So all of the processes that I am working through with the business owner is not explicitly to increase the valuation it is explicitly to improve the quality of the business and yeah. and as a byproduct the quality of life of the of the owner but there is another side to it which is that having a business which is valuable is enormously important right yeah. most business owners that i talk to are incredibly disappointed with the valuation of their business if they haven't made this transition because yeah. they're right in the middle of the business and the value of the business ends up being defined. Uh, it's basically they're doing the job instead of, instead of actually owning the business, they're in the business. And when they're in the business, it's very, very hard for someone to buy that business because because it's basically the business is that business owner. Super common, super common. I, I, I would see that more than, than I don't see it where the, the owner is the business. It's a, maybe it's a great lifestyle business, but it's not a transferable business. And ultimately they're limiting their options. If they're planning on retiring, if they need an, a liquidity event, from the exit, if that's one of their goals, maybe they're they're coasting along and making good money. But if they don't maximize value, then they just have less options when if they do want to sell it. Yeah, well, I mean, all of us. You have a model. I have a model. The banks have a model. They all have, they all have a model for valuing a business, and a very significant part of that valuation of the business is the extent to which the business owner is actually dispensable that, that they they can actually sit above and they have an effective organization with or without them that yeah. they are yeah. they can move from being 100 percent working inside the business to being the owner and then essentially the director of that business yeah. then the valuation of the business increases enormously and, and what's happening i'm working with one one client right now his goal is to expand 
to get his expansion, he needs to ensure the valuation of the business is, is appropriate for the bank to then say, okay, we can leverage you appropriately because now your the valuation of your business is sufficiently high for us to feel comfortable to give you the loan to acquire the next one. Yeah, so there's kind of a, a snowball effect here. If you if you increase the, the the value of the business, then you can scale quicker. Scalability is something that that we talk about a lot. You know, changes not just where you can spend your resources, your financial resources, or leverage your financial resources, but what about your time? What does it do when you when you've maximized the value? How does that affect the owners? You're creating an owner's chair instead of an operating chair. I like how you call it the director's seat. What does that do for an owner? as far as how they spend their own time. Right. Um, well, firstly, it gives them the opportunity for free time and leisure, right? I mean, like, ultimately, the reason why a business, business owner owns a business is because they're looking for prosperity. And prosperity is not just cash, it's time as well. And in fact, you could argue time is, if, if you don't have both, then, then it's irrelevant. The, uh, but the other thing in terms of uh, to exactly to your scalability point, once you, if a business owner has created the blueprint for a business which is operating and it's very smoothly operating, that also they can say, oh, okay, fine, now I can open the same business in a different job, be using exactly the same template because it's working. Right? Mm -hmm. So that, that again gives them that kind of that, that scale out opportunity. But, but yeah, the, the most important thing is to be able to build the, to have the time, to have the income and have the trusted team in place so that the business can operate and, and that you can enjoy your life. And at the same time, the byproduct of that is you've got, you're massively increasing the valuation of the business. So we're staying on this topic, why maximize uh, a business value, which it seems like kind of a silly question. I mean, you think everybody would want to, but it's true. Most people get to a certain stage and in, in this, I, I mentioned this coasting thing. And some of the things that we talked about is money begets money. So it enables scalability and then um, it gives you more time. But another thing that we, that, that is worth noting, I think, is if you build it a little bit bigger, you have some more stability. If you've got a team built in, you've got more revenue built in, and then maybe unknown events happen. I don't know, maybe a pandemic, maybe your business, if it's, if you've maximized value is going to be a little bit stronger and be able to withstand some unknown events that are inevitably they always happen. Do you see that a lot in your, in your, with your clients? Yeah, I see that a lot. I mean, I see, you know, there, there could be marriage breakups, which cause a need for evaluation, but I'm, I'm working with a, another um, business where the business owner was thinking that he was going to pass the business down to his children. Yeah. And they, and now they don't want it. Um, and he wants, he's ready to retire. And he's, he's right now, he's got a business, which is where he is right in the middle of it and he can't sell it. It basically has a, a, a negligible valuation. Yeah. And that's his nest egg. So is he going to carry on working until he's 80 or 85? Um, because right now that's, that's his only option if he wants to carry on getting money out of the business. So making the transition so he can make it sellable mm -hmm. and putting in the team in place, his, the, the, the opportunity for that business is still very significant. He just needs to make that transition to a business which has a management team which, because selling a business is really about providing something which someone wants to buy, right? Correct. And, and so whoever is going to buy that business wants to be able to see that there is revenue growth, there is margin growth, it's on a trajectory, it has a vision. And, yeah. and that is what they're acquiring as part of, part of the transaction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I hear people hear me say all the time, I call it the three P's business owners or buyers want something that makes money. So profit, they want something that it has people because back to, they don't want to be the business. And then the process is something that's super important as well. How do we communicate with our customers? How do we find new customers? How do we, how do we keep all of this running? That's more about 
is it owner dependent or not? So I think all these things are, are tied together. So, okay, well, it sounds like it's really important to maximize value if, if an owner is looking to keep their, have the most options for exit and they don't have to, if they're comfortable with a lifestyle business, they can keep it small if that works for them. And, and that is an option. But if, if um, there's, there's a lot of benefits to keeping the foot on the gas pedal and getting it to a state where you've got some extra reserves and it's scalable and it's more transferable in the event something unknown happens. So I think we, we, we did a pretty good job of beating that point down that it's important to maximize value in a business. So I wanna, I wanna pivot a little bit to talk about how do you do this? How, how do you, what is it that maximizes value? And we've kind of already started down this, this thread, but let's start to talk about that. You mentioned this, the director's chair, the difference between being an operator and, and, and delegation. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, about that. The owner starts out, they're a sales guy. What happens? What has to happen? Yeah, so, so there's an interesting process which happens. So they, the, the business owner starts making sales and, and pretty typically is, is slammed doing a bit of everything. And so I was working with one of my clients the other day and, and he was telling me that he makes a pretty constant margin on all of the products that he sells. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, that's interesting. So now let's, let's go back and, and look at what margin did you actually make on those sales? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, that's really kind of interesting. I, uh, there is 25% of the business which I'm doing, I'm making 18%. And 25%, 30%, I'm making 45%. And if, when we look at the numbers, the business which is getting 18% it was basically losing him money. It was, it was re really not very attractive business at all. Yeah. And then, then when we looked at the 45%, that was actually for his, for, for the business that he's in, was actually quite a high margin. It was a good level of profitability. What was more interesting is that that business is highly scalable. So, so now he's completely transitioning his business to focus on the, on on the opportunities which are generating the 45% plus margin. Mm -hmm. That's and 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 he's going to dramatically change the not only the valuation of the business, but but just the entire quality of the business because he's only now going to, he's going to be dealing with with clients that that see him as the market leader. But the, the, there's, there's almost a direct correlation between the higher the margin that you can make on the business is, is, is a, the higher respect you have in the market for the, for the product and service that you're providing. That's why you're able to command that, that premium. Mm -hmm. So that evolution to higher margin business, firing the low margin business, and then building, building the opportunities which are actually going to sustain the business into the future, that's that's a whole transition, but you only know that when you do the analysis. You, yeah. it, 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 you, you can't you can't just trust your instinct that things are working. You have to go out and, and actually really know your numbers. So this gets back to what we we're talking about in the beginning of why you need a coach, because I, I would imagine this this owner um, that you're talking about that found a very lucrative part of of, of his his or her business that's very scalable. That's a strategic insight that you, you may not see if you're just busy operating. You have to, to your point, you have to really back up and look at how is this business operating and where's the, where's the most lucrative part? Where are the margins at? Um, it reminds me, I heard a guy say as a joke, you know, we lose money in every deal, but we make it up in volume. Like that's the wrong way to do it, right? <laughs> um, right. But no, this, I love this, this strategic approach of figuring out how the, the business can operate most productively and then focusing your, then you can focus your marketing on it. Then you can decide who to hire for those positions. Then you can get out of the operator seat because you can em employ those resources to execute on what's, what's truly possible. Um, but, but I want to talk about that, that owner's role of, of going from kind of a reactive to, to proactive when, when it comes to either customer acquisition or, or finding deals or, or, or whatever, I mean, how, 
how does an owner, when should an owner do that? Let's just talk about that mindset for a minute. Yeah, I, I believe that nearly all businesses, nearly all business owners can build a business which is best in breed in, 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 in a very well-defined segment. So if I'm, if I'm an, an air conditioning company, I can say that I'm going to be the owner of these subdivisions. I'm not going to go for every single subdivision within, within 50 miles of me. I'm going to focus and I'm going to build the reputation in that market and I'm going to get the economies of scale by, by identifying those markets. And, and I'm going to get the economies of scale of marketing and I'm going to get visibility and, I'm, and, and I, am, I am going to be the best, right? Yeah. So, or it could be in technology space or it could be in any other space. But once you have identified the markets which you are, which you are going to be recognized as being the best, you then either through through scale or because you have such a strong reputation through price and generally both you then move from being marginally profitable to being healthily very healthily profitable and and going back to the acquisition thing that's a wonderful thing for, for someone to buy because that's 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 a franchise that dominates a territory and yeah. any franchise that dominates a territory is worth it's weight in gold right yeah yeah so so um when you say who wants to buy this and everyone raises their hand um sounds good but maybe it's better to be picky and say i only want this one this is the best one for me to spend my time on which is counterintuitive if if you're in that sales seat and you haven't done this strategic work to to get picky on opportunities um and, and all this is reminding me of a, an owner I spoke with recently who chose a, um, a lucrative segment in healthcare, which is important right now. And it had elements of recurring revenue. And this owner, I'm salivating when I'm talking to this owner because um, <laughs> it's like this, I just keep hearing all these good things. Um, he said, you know what? When I go to a staff meeting, I have to wear a name tag. People don't even know that I work there. I had so much management installed, was so absentee from the business that he wasn't the face of the business. And that's that's often rare in, in small businesses doing, you know, a few million, few million dollars a year. But um, this is a good example of somebody who is selective on opportunities, didn't do all healthcare, only did the the cherry, picked the cherry opportunities, turned the rest away, and it delegated staff. And I'm talking to this owner thinking, oh, this, this, there's a lot of people who would want to buy this business. The, the decisions that this owner has made has turned into something that's an extremely marketable product that a lot of people would want to, want to, want to buy. So um, talking about this, going from a salesperson to a manager or a, a director, I think that's, that should be the goal. I think that's not what people think about often when they start a new business and they have grandiose uh, ideas of, of where their business will be. Maybe a lot of people start out and they just like what they do and they want to do more of it, but it's a different mindset to shift into this director status. Yeah. I, I, I think, I mean, part of the problem is that as a business owner, there's, there's a certain amount of discretionary income. And so if the, if the business owner is earning what he thinks is a pretty decent amount of discretionary income, Yes. Um, it's kind of scary, right? Because if I, if I suddenly hand over $50,000 to a salesperson, I'm taking that $50,000 out of my pocket, right? <laughs> because I was earning that money before. And, and that salesperson may take, you know, 60, 90 days to even to be able to demonstrate that he's been successful. It's a risk. So it's, it's a risk, investment. right? I mean, and, and, and 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 the reason why it's a risk is because generally they haven't put in the system so they haven't got the marketing flow which is driving the sales to enable a salesperson to be successful mm -hmm. so they've got to make sure that they have a process in place to know 
that that salesperson is going to be successful. Not that it's a that it's a um, you know a high vulnerability thing. The I mean, as you know, from a business valuation perspective, if if the if the owner's discretionary income is is you know say two hundred thousand or one hundred fifty thousand, and but they're entirely they're the only person that can do the sales. They're the only person that can keep the equipment going. The valuation is not very high, but but when they move to bring in a salesperson, even if the profitability in the in the near term only stays roughly constant, the valuation of the business is now on its upward trajectory. Right. So 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 they're doing a number of things which are really important. One is that they're enabling. I mean these. Owners are not the best salespeople. They happen to be effective salespeople because they're passionate about it and, and they, they honestly, truly believe in the product and the quality of the product and quality of service. Yes. But when they bring the salespeople, then that's the point at which they start moving to being really scalable. Yeah. This, this idea of taking earnings Sellers discretionary earnings, SDE, cash flow. Us intermediaries have a lot of words for cash flow. And investing in, I'm going to call it management, just making an absentee is huge. It's so important that when we look at multiples of earning and how we're going to apply a valuation to a cash flow, if a business is truly absentee, is not owner dependent, then we use a different multiple. And we, we look at multiple of EBITDA, which is a financial term, but it's basically saying this is how much money the business makes after management's been paid. The next owner does not have to delegate a huge amount of time. And maybe you're going to spend more. You'll have less profit after paying the manager, but that cash flow measurement will be multiplied in excess of what the multiple of SDE would be. So it's worth investing in, in management and and staff and help. And I'll take it a step further and say that when I look at financials and people aren't paying enough for payroll or commissions on sales, um, they're keeping too much money. It sounds like a good thing, but we always compare businesses to their peers. And if they're not spending enough on payroll, it's actually, even if they're super profitable, it's not good. And, and owners or buyers are gonna see through that and say, well, this is unsustainable. I can't do the work that the current owner is doing. So it's gotta be done got to be done. It's only going to increase value. Um, okay. Well, so we talked a, about moving to director status, investing in, in salespeople and becoming more of a manager working on the business, not in the business. I want to, I want to come back to, um, you know, coaches role and understanding that helping an owner pick which investments to that'll translate into to greater sales and earnings. And I want to just talk about like, you know, how do you help an owner figure out where these profit centers are? So an owner needs to think about where they're going to make investments within their business. Talk to us a little bit about how you do that analysis. I think this was that strategic work you were mentioning earlier. Yeah. Um, okay. One step backwards. Sure. I mean, my, my role is not as a consultant. My role is not to... to solve a business problem is to enable the business owner to solve the problems yeah so it's really an education process now that doesn't when they when we look at when we look at market opportunities i'll work with them in terms of how good a strategic fit is this new this new opportunity or this revised direction going to be but i'm very strong on test and verification so once, if, once you've understood what you think is the next, next direction, don't bet the shop on it, test it, yes. right? Evaluate it, put out, go out. If you think that you're going to be going after, take my HVAC example, we're going to be going after multiple subdivisions. Let's test it with one in a, in a, in, in a small level investment enough to demonstrate that it can work. And yeah. then once we have proven it, then scale it up. So I'm not, you know, I don't think business owners should be betting the shop on, on, on a strategic direction that they haven't validated. 
Very smart. Yeah. A B testing. I know that websites do it all the time. They do it with individual ads. You can do that with a business as well. All the time. All the time. I mean, every every marketing program, most marketing programs do A B testing. Test yeah. this message, te yeah. test that message, evaluate the response, and then and then the things that are working scale up. The the part of the goal of, of the coaching process is to take some of the mystery out of the processes, right? It, to take out the invention because it's already been invented. It's just a question of applying it. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about how do you choose the, 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 the right segment for the business? Um, what business do you want to win? That Those answers come from testing take small bets. Don't, don't go all in on one direction with your strategy see what's working, learn from prior successes and tweak it. And, and adjacencies. So if you know that you're successful in market A, then, and market B is directly adjacent and your reputation in market A is going to give you an unfair advantage to be able to compete in market B, mm -hmm. then that makes a lot of sense. And if you already have, if if the, if market B is actually already a customer of you, then that kind of vertical vertical integration is is you know very attractive. And if you've already proven horizontally, then go to the next horizontal, go to the next market. Which and that's the benefit of having creating that really effective team because I say I've got an effective team. I just need to clone that. Once you learn how to execute, you can expand and it's back to that scalability. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention as, as an intermediary, this idea, you know, vertical integration within a company, you could buy another company to vertically integrate as well or horizontally integrate. So sometimes uh, acquisitions can be a part of an exit plan. I've had, I've had owners come to me and say, I need X for my business or a private equity said they could give me X amount, but I had to grow by this much. So now I want to go out and buy another HVAC company, for example, in order to achieve my goals of, of putting these together right. and getting bigger. We've already got the scalability. We can buy quicker than we can market. So I think that's really smart. And, and you're acquiring robustness because, you know, that at any moment in time, one business is going to outperform another. And so you can carry on growing based on, on where you're seeing your successes. So you're, you're starting to, to, to put your bets on more than one table. Yeah. And, and it may be that the business which you end up, which ends up generating the most profit for you is not the one you started on. Wow, where's, where's the time go, Nigel? We've already been, it's already <laughs> uh, been talking for more than 30 minutes already. Um, I want to start to wrap things up. Um, you know, what we've been talking about is why a business coach, I hope you're hearing all of the value that you can get from a business coach and why you shouldn't uh, coast, why you should always be thinking about maximizing value and the options that could open up for you as an owner, um, especially if you're aware of where you are. I'm big on talking with owners about where are you in, in this, this psychological stage of running a business. You don't want to realize that you're in the transition phase you want to actually consider this stuff when you're close to the peak phase. And then how exactly do you maximize value? It's kind of what we've been talking about. Um, I'll ask you just a follow up final question here. You know, uh, is there anything you'd like to add? What does success look like? I'm sure you see a lot of success with your clients. And um, yeah, just I'll just end with that kind of open question, Nigel. Talk to us about what success looks like for the, the clients you've worked with who have really hit it out of the park with these things. Well, the as as you know, I've I've worked on a number of exits, and um, and some of those have been turnarounds. Um, some of them have been um, straightforward. Um, the business was growing exactly as it was meant to, right? Um, so, so success is really about achieving the vision, achieve, achieving the goals that the business set for the business, which is why it's important to have a goal. You've got to you know, know where you're, what you're trying to accomplish and know when you've accomplished it. It's a bit like being in the stock market, right? If, if I have a stock and, I, and I, I bought it at 
twenty dollars, and my goal was to make to for to sell it at fifty dollars. When it hits fifty dollars, at least I can take some money off the table, and now I'm just playing with the house money. Right? Yeah, yeah. So and, and so that's so the goal is to business owners. Uh, generally want to have some wealth out of their business and and when they achieve wealth i consider that to be a success yeah um but at the same time I, i'm working with two companies that are growing at better than 100 percent per annum and and every company that i've been working with went through the COVID stuff survived and is and is in, on a growth trajectory these are all successes it's being able to to achieve the best possible outcome given the market circumstances, mm -hmm. and if that and 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 then opening people's eyes to opening the owner's eyes to where their real strengths are and, and capitalize them even more than they had imagined was available to them. I like that. Thank thank you for for that. Um, well, at this time, I want you to to hang with me. I'm going to ask. Uh, let's see. I'm going to. I'm going to throw your contact information back up on the screen here, and I'm just going to share this. So we're both we're both still here. I want to ask. Um, oh, I've got your contact information, Nigel Elkin at, at ActionCoach.com. I got a phone number up on the screen as well for how people can reach you. Are there any other plugs? Is there anywhere else you want to send people if they want to learn more about you, if they'd like to connect with you? I want to give you a chance to give any plugs that you might have. Yeah, just just drop me a line or, or contact me through LinkedIn or or how, however, whatever medium, I will obviously get back to you as, as soon as it's humanly practical. Well, thank you for that, Nigel. And I think for those of you who have joined us today, you got some value out of that. You've heard from a, a person who's guided a lot of entrepreneurs through all of these different stages. He's very focused on success and, and a pragmatic approach. I'll add to that. So great, great resource. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm going to just go through a couple more slides. I mentioned I do a, a lot of webinars. They can all be found at RaleighBusinessBroker.com. I'm extremely excited that next month I will be doing this again with Kim Mills. And Kim is with uh, Phoenix Commercial Properties, and we're going to be talking about commercial real estate and what business owners have with commercial real estate, how that affects the sale of their business. So definitely go to RaleighBusinessBroker.com slash webinars. You can RSVP for that webinar today, as well as any of my other specialty webinars for other deal partners, real estate agents, accounting professionals, and financial advisors. Lastly, here's my contact information. I, I hope that what you've seen from today is that I'm very focused on, on providing education for my deal partners and partnering with, with those of you out there that would like to work together. So let's let's drop a line if we haven't connected already. Neil at vrbiztriangle.com or raleighbusinessbroker.com. Check out my YouTube channel. This will go up on YouTube as will the other deal partner interviews that I've done. And with that, I will minimize my screen. I will... Thank Nigel once again, and I will say for, for Neil Isaacs and Nigel Elkin, this is VR Business Brokers signing off. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.